Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you here, and we welcome you all. Uh, we know that you almost risked your life to be here, but we're glad to see you, and we trust that you will know God's blessing as we worship together. I will have to take photographs uh, to record your attendance, and if you are a visitor, would you please leave your name and phone number with one of the ushers in case we have to contact you. Uh, we thank you for the donations to the food bank. We were able to take 40 pounds, and I can't remember the numbers, kilograms of food, but I know that the food bank was very grateful for it. So we thank you, and we thank the PW for gathering it and delivering it. This is the last day for the shoe boxes, so um, if you haven't your shoe box here today, I think you'll have to ask Barbara for grace, and uh, she'll, you'll be taking them tomorrow probably, Wednesday, so there's a couple of days for you to stay. On this Remembrance Sunday, we listen to the prophet Isaiah. Those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. The words of the psalmist, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Let us praise God as we sing together, seated and, and softly. God is our strength and refuge. <coughs> Join together in prayer. Let us pray. Most gracious God, whose love reaches out to us no matter where we are, no matter what we do, we offer our thanks for the good of creation and the renewing liberty of your grace. We rejoice in the freedom and 
peace in which we live. Especially on this day, we give thanks for the remembrance of those whose lives were given in time of war, and for the bonds of friendship and appreciation between the nations of the world. Forgive us when we fail to be the hand of peace, the voice of magnanimity, and the example of justice in our lives. Forgive us when we keep silence when we should be speaking out. Lord Jesus, you call us to receive your forgiveness and to practice it in our lives, whether we want it or not, whether we deserve it or seek it. And you call us always to seek reconciliation with all the people we meet. Enable us in all things to seek the good of the world, to practice forgiveness and reconciliation, to work for the increase of peace and justice, to show respect for all, and to practice generosity of spirit and openness of hospitality. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We remember before God the men and women of all nations who have died as a result of war. Those who we have known and whose memory we treasure. Those who we never knew. And those who died unknown. We will remember all who lived in hope but died in vain, the tortured, the innocent, the starving and the exiled, the imprisoned, the oppressed and the disappeared. Would you please stand? They shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. Amen. And we now observe two minutes. John Elliot to lay our congregational rules.
remember, O Lord, all those who have died the death of honour and are departed in the hope of resurrection to eternal life, especially the officers, men and women of our sea, land and air forces, to whom it was given to lay down their lives for the cause of freedom and justice. In that place of light, where sorrow and mourning are no more, give them rest, O Lord, through faith in the blood of your own dear Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. We now have uh, videos of the girl from school nearby, and the words are very important. turn to God's word now and we're going to look at Gospel chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. And reading from verse 1, we hear the word of God. As he looked up, Jesus saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. I tell you the truth, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she gave out of her poverty, put, all, put in all she had to live on. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, As for what you see here, the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they asked, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are about to take place? He replied, 
reply, Watch out that you are not deceived. For many will come in my name, claiming I am he, and the time is near. Do not follow them. When you hear of wars and revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first. But the end will not come right away. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, and pestilences in various places, and fearful events, and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you. They will deliver you to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors, and all on account of my name. This will result in your being witnesses to them. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves, for I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, relatives and friends, and will put some of you to death. All men will hate you because of me. But not a hair of your head will perish. By standing firm, you will gain life. We pray that God adds his blessing to this his holy word and gives us understanding. We join together in prayer. Let us pray. Most gracious God and Father, in whose will is our peace, Turn our hearts and the hearts of all to yourself, that by the power of your Spirit, the peace which is founded on righteousness may be established throughout the whole world. We pray for the victims of war, the injured and the disabled, for the mentally distressed, and for those whose faith in God and man has been weakened or destroyed. For those who mourn that they're dead, those who have lost husband or wife, children or parents. And especially for those who have no hope in Christ to sustain them in their grief. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, have compassion on those for whom we pray. And help us to use all suffering in the cause of your kingdom. We pray for the Queen and her family and all who under her bear the responsibility of government. For those who serve in the armed forces of the crown, for doctors, nurses, chaplains, and all who, minister, all who minister to those in need or distress, for the unity of our people within the Commonwealth, for the sacrifices made especially in two world wars whereby our peace has been preserved, for the sacrifices made by many in the cause of peace in our own province. All our prayers we bring through him who gave himself for us on the cross, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. There's an African proverb that says when elephants fight, it is the grass that suffers. The proverb is saying while nations and powers fight among themselves, the ordinary people, the grassroots, suffer the most. And isn't that so true? Usually those who make the decision to wage wars, whether military or legislative or economic, have the least to lose. <coughs> Neither Joe Biden nor Donald Trump had much to lose in losing the US election. Yes, there's a loss of power, the loss of prestige, but their essential well-being 
was not threatened in any way. They were going to be all right, win or lose. The same cannot be said for their staff and ancillary workers, of whom there are many. The losing team all lose their jobs, even though they have mortgages to pay, children to feed. They're on the employment list. It's the same with the lockdowns here. The MPs, the government officials, the, the scientific specialists, the medical people, they make decisions that really won't cause any of them to suffer very much. But to waiters and waitresses, and cooks and bakers and owners of small businesses, it has a big impact. They too still have their bills to pay. And of course, the sad story state of war always takes its toll on the ordinary folk. No matter what nation is at war, the greatest suffering is the ordinary man and woman. Now, all of these situations mentioned may well be necessary. Politicians need to be changed. Lockdowns maybe are necessary for the national good and wars sadly sometimes are necessary too if we're not to allow evil to flourish. Where then does our faith, our scriptures, our God fit in all this? There are many, even this very day, who find themselves in a hopeless situation. They're suffering because of powerful forces beyond themselves. Forces that are not their fault, over which they have no control. And they're asking why? How long is this going to last? Does God care? In Luke 21, Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples that might help us answer some of these questions. The chapter begins with Jesus commending the sacrificial offering of a poor widow at the temple. She gave a couple of coppers, which was nothing compared to the enormous donations that others were giving. Jesus commended her because she gave everything. Those who gave a lot still had a lot to keep. She gave everything. And Jesus saw that and commended her. What we give to God and what we withhold is important. It's important to him. It reflects the attitude of the heart. After commending the poor widow, Jesus looks around at all the splendor of the temple, all the grandeur, all the opulence, and he says, one day all of this will be destroyed. He then expands by saying, the temple's destruction will take place because of the ensuing political crisis between Rome and Judea. Because of this, Jesus warns his followers so that they would be prepared, that they would be aware when the time comes. What he says sounds ominous. When you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened, he says. These things must happen first, but the end will not be right away. Then he said that a nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, famines, pestilences in various places, and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison, and you will be brought before kings and governors, all on account of my name. So 
you will bear witness to me. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand. Don't worry how you will defend yourself, for I will give you the words and the wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers, sisters, relatives and friends, and will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. But not a hair of your head will perish. Stand firm and you will live. It wasn't the most cheery sermon to give. It wasn't the most cheerful news for Jesus' followers to hear. It wouldn't encourage them, it wouldn't brighten up their day. But it was the truth. And it's better to hear the truth and prepare for the truth. Jesus' disciples, like the many soldiers from war times to the ordinary working people of our time, will be the victims of events that are unavoidable, but not their doing. And yet Jesus said to those who are suffering that they're not without hope. He says if they endure and stand firm, their life will be preserved. Jesus says to them, as he says to us today, even though you face events that are beyond your control, put your faith in the God who is in control. The events in your life are beyond your control. You can't do anything about it. But put your trust in the God who is in control. I'm sure the disciples were both concerned and comforted by Jesus' words to them. Finding the strength and courage to remain strong and firm despite the looming threat of distress and despair is not easy. Even so, Jesus is saying that is the best option for people who suffer like the grass under fighting elephants. Standing firm in our own strength isn't standing firm. Persevering in our own thoughts and actions isn't standing firm. Our endurance and strong stance is effective and sure when it's on the solid rock of Christ Jesus. Last week we talked about the wise and the foolish man building on the rock and the sand. To try to stand on our own strength means we will fall with a great clash. Standing on the rock means life can throw the worst storm it can muster. Poverty, distress, war. We can still stand because of our sure foundation, which is Jesus Christ. Whatever life throws at us these days, and a lot is being thrown at us, we can stand firm when we place our trust and our confidence in the God who is in control and directing the affairs of both heaven and earth. But to stand may not be all we have to do. Sometimes we have to stand and fight. We are thankful to those who fought for us and our freedom in two world wars. We know they had to defeat a terrible enemy. God's own people, the Jews, had to fight their enemies too. 
some very bloody battles. But Jesus fought the greatest enemy. The greatest enemy to all of us. <laughs> sin and death. And when he chose to die on the cross, it was to pay the price for us. And in doing that, in doing that, he defeated those great enemies, sin and death. And not all who repent, repent of their own sin, and receive his forgiveness, have eternal life and have complete forgiveness of sin. Think of that. Life everlasting. Complete forgiveness of sins. No wonder it's the good news. Jesus stood firm and fought for us. He died for us. He loved us that much. Maybe he's calling us to fight for him. Not by taking up cudgels and guns and weapons, but to fight for his truth to be heard again in our world. To fight for his values. To fight for what he told us was the greatest commandment. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your neighbour as yourself. You know, if those greatest commandments were observed in the higher power, the higher echelons of life in this world, there would be no war, there would be no inequities, there would be no injustice. It's a dream, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't do our part to promote his kingdom. A kingdom that doesn't have borders. A kingdom that doesn't have armies, but a kingdom that will endure and last forever. Be sure you're in that kingdom. Let us pray. God our Father, we are fed so much information about the kingdoms of this world. We're fed so much information about the people of this world. But Father, help us to lift our eyes higher lift our eyes to you and help us to aspire higher to be part of your kingdom. We thank you that you made membership of that kingdom so easy for us. We just have to be humble and ask the way. We thank you, Father, for that. And we pray that you will send us home from church rejoicing, rejoicing that we are part of that kingdom and rejoicing because we know the God who is in control. We pray in the name of Christ our Saviour.
may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.